Hello, and welcome to my podcast, Good Grief. My name is Dr. Christine Malone, and in this podcast, we talk about trauma, tragedy, and survival. In each episode, I will interview someone that has gone through grief in some way, and we will discuss the impact it has had on their life. By sharing these stories, we hope that others won't feel alone should they be going through similar situations. Enjoy. Okay, guests, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. My guest today is going to tell us a bit about his experiences uh, with grief that started in his childhood and um, what he's doing with all that uh, today. So, guest, if you would introduce yourself and just tell you tell our listeners a bit about you, you know, whatever you want to share about your story. Absolutely. Uh, and first, I just want to say thank you for having me. Uh, it's an it's an honor to be here. Uh, my name is Reggie Ford. I am uh, a Nashville native, but I'm I'm repping Seattle today. You can't see it, but I'm I'm repping my Seattle gear. And uh I my my early experiences, I had a lot of childhood trauma, but my first rec- recognition of of grief in my life came when I was younger. Um at 8 years old, my father who wasn't in my life like every day. He wasn't an everyday staple in my life, but he was a a significant person that I looked up to and that I longed to have a relationship with. Uh, at eight years old, he uh, ended up in prison. And I remember turning on the TV and seeing his face and seeing all these you know heinous crimes beside his face uh, for everything he had done and thinking life was, life was changing because I had heard phone calls and he's going to go away for a weekend or a month or whatever it may be. But this was like, okay, no, this, 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 there are years behind this and who knows what this looks like. And so as a young boy growing up, I'm just, I, my whole sense of, of I don't, a connection, a lot of connection to the world, honestly, um, and, and connection and trust to other people around me, especially men, uh, just went downhill during that point and created a lot of anger and resentment toward a lot of people, my dad even, um, and then even my mom to an to, to a extent, just because sh- this is who you picked to be my father and now he's gone, mm-hmm. you know? And so it was, it was a lot of changes in my life. And I just remember creating a lot of anger and in, in little bitty me. So that was, yeah. that was one of the earlier, earlier episodes for sure. And as an eight year old, I mean, your ability to really kind of process any of that is pretty, pretty non-existent for most eight year olds. Right? Yeah. If, if you don't have that strong support around you. So um, I'm thinking about, you know, your, your friends at the time, you know, schoolmates and so on, how that might be, uh, or I'm sure was, was difficult for you when mm-hmm. they, when they knew this story and so on. And, and, and again, that we talked about the stigma like where I started to record, but that kind of a, you know, stigma to it really attaches and becomes um, an embarrassment, if you will, for you, even though you didn't do anything wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. So along those lines. So Absolutely. time goes by and you eventually were, um, ended up in college um and tell us a bit about that and i know there's a story about football and such in there so tell us about that yeah so i i was actually kind of a couple years after my dad went to prison i ended up in this football league um called backfield in motion that was the first place that i was able to play organized sports because it was completely free and i grew up in poverty so playing sports was was i could do it in the backyard and things like that but i could never play organized sports so this nonprofit comes in and allows us to do all of that. And our the first year I played, I made the all-star game. And that all-star game was at Vanderbilt University Stadium, a uh, school here in Nashville, Tennessee. And I remember running up and down the field thinking, I'm going to play here one day. Like, this is going to be where I go. And so, and and mind you, my, my dad was in prison. He didn't, he didn't go to college. He didn't graduate from high school. My mom didn't graduate from high school. So this would have been very unprecedented to go to, you know, Vandy now is a top 20, sometimes top 15 university in the country. And to, to say I'm going there was uh, unimaginable for, for some folks coming from where I came. And, but that's what I set my mind on. And so, you know, fast forward, football became a huge part of my life um, to the, to the point where, you know, through that program, I got identified by um, a p- local private school, one of the the best private schools in the state, and, and if not the Southeast. And that continued to open doors for me. Uh, 
And eventually I ended up at Vanderbilt University where I had set my sights on so, so many years early, earlier. And I played, I walked on and played football there and ended up having a great uh, career and experience playing. Um, but then toward my the the end of my junior year after we played in a bowl game and I was sitting there with a tough decision I was not doing it as well as I wanted to academically in school and so football was a big part of that just because of the time that it took and the demand of it all so I, I just decided that I needed to focus on my academics and not spend all of my time playing and I, I went, I remember going to my, my strength coach at the time. He was one of the coaches that I was most close with. And as soon as I walked into his office, this is like right after the Christmas break. And I started bawling. <laughs> I started bawling because I knew on the other side of that, I would never be able to strap up pads. I would never be able to run up and down the field with, you know, 11 on 11 again. Like you cannot simulate football mm. as a, as a non professional and so um yeah but I, I told him that I loved him I loved the team I didn't have the courage to address the team at the time but uh that I was done playing football and I avoided using the word quit for years like I I finished playing I was done playing I you know left football behind whatever but I avoided using the word quit for so many years um and then after that my 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 teammates and all the guys that I played with, they're still playing and they had a lot of success. We were under a new coaching regime with James Franklin and um, there were, you know, nine win seasons, which was unheard of at Vanderbilt. And I didn't watch a single game. I did not. I could not watch a single game. Like anytime I heard about football, people talked about football, I just got this sickness to my stomach because it was it was a big part of my identity. It, it was, even though I had other talents and skills and everything, I had lost something. I lost the love of mine and football was a love. And I say it's akin to losing just, you know, a person that you love. And, uh, I didn't know how to cope with that. I didn't know. I didn't realize that me saying, I'm going to walk away from football. I'm going to quit football. However you want to phrase it was going to hurt and impact me so much, but it did. And, around that same time I started, um, drinking alcohol, like I was 21. And so, um, that was when it really started to show and I'd be at a party and having a great time. And then next thing you know, I'm on the floor bawling and crying. And first I'm talking about football, but then I'm talking about, you know, the loss of my cousin who got murdered or this person who I'm, I just miss so much. And, and like, it just brought up so much for me. Um, but football is kind of that, that catalyst that, would always trigger it because I'm around football players. I'm I'm seeing it, but just not being able to play anymore. It was tough. Yeah, it's losing a, a piece of your identity. I mean, it's it's who you Absolutely. are. Absolutely. Right? I mean, Absolutely. A, lot, a lot of us, what we do, whether it's sports or job or whatever, it, it's part of who we are. So losing that or losing the, in some cases, the ability to do that as well can really cause, um, you know, quite a bit of, of grief as you kind of go mm -hmm. through that. And, um, did you ever think about you wanted to go back? Did you ever regret your decision? I had many times where I thought about going back, um, especially because because I mean, even to to this day, I have dreams where I'm playing again. And like so like but when I first when I when I first quit, it was it was like every night. And so I'd wake up and I'm like, OK, I'm headed to practice. No, I'm not. I'm not going to practice. And and so I I did. And I actually um got asked to come back. And this was right at a time where they were offering scholarships and like just. I just in my in my gut, like I, I I couldn't. I knew I knew why I came to college, and it was it was preventing that from happening. It was preventing me from being the best student that I could be. Um, and also, like at that time, I had so many just like your body playing college football at a high level or even professional, but like like it hurts. It hurts all the time, and I was just over it. I was just over hobbling to the bathroom. I'm over just like the random aches and pains and jumping out of your sleep with cramps and all that. Like I was just over it. And so um, the regret that I had, um, I don't, I don't know if I, I would call it, I, I wouldn't call it regret. Um, it was, it was just a longing, a longing for it and, and missing it. But even to this day, if people ask me like, do I miss the game? I miss the camaraderie. I miss the brotherhood. Yeah. I, I don't necessarily miss playing football. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I told you before we started recording. My husband's a youth football coach, and I, you're, you're, you're sharing. Tell, I mean, I, I can think of many stories he's told me about the kids that he coaches mm -hmm. and how, how they all feel about that and so on. So I, yeah. I, I, get, it. I get it. Um, <laughs> then there's a part of your story that I'm seeing here. You had some caregivers and guardians that raised you, and you had some um, people pass away and some estrangements happen. So tell us a bit about that. Yeah. So uh, long my life, like my 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 mom had me at, at a very young age. And so there needed to be a village around me just to uh, see that I survived, that we both survived, honestly. Um, she was 14 when she had me. And so we were living with my my grandmother, my grandfather uh, when I was born. And then ultimately my my dad's parents stepped up tremendously in my life and were a nurturing, loving, caring um, source for me. Like they were, they were true love for me, unconditional. And so, and they're actually, you can see these, Christine, but I don't think everybody else will, but the, the pictures above my shoulders, yeah. um, they, they, my grandmother in, in 2018, late 2018, right before Christmas was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. Uh -huh. Um, her lung cancer had metastasized. So stage four brain cancer. And, um, that started a whole just like explosion of chaos within my family. And um, January 1st, a little bit after that, I was, you know, hoping to wake up to a, you know, happy new year. Good morning. Uh, but my first call in 2019 was from my dad, who had gotten out of prison at the time. He was, And we had grown really close. We had grown like to be best friends. And he, it's his mom who was diagnosed and he calls me and says that something's not right. Like she's, she's not right. You gotta get over here. And he seems stunned on the phone, just very shocked. And so I rush over and I, I walk in, I see my grandmother, she's like stiff as a plank in the bed. And I just like dropped to my knees thinking like, this is my first sight in this new year. Um, coming to find out, um, I see her like move a little bit. So I walk in and like, her lips are pursed, her eyes are bulging out of her face. And like, she's just like sweating profusely. And she, she, she doesn't say much, but she keeps saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I'm like, you have no reason to be sorry. Like, like you, I'm so, I'm sorry. Like, I want to take away all your pain in this moment. Um, come to find out she had, uh, she had been overdosed a, a steroid to reduce some swelling on her brain. Uh, right after a surgery to remove one of the tumors and so like she was just completely out of her mind and uh, she attempted to overdose on insulin that morning mm -hmm. and so she had taken every pin that she could around her and her blood sugar had dropped um, severely low like the, the the EMTs got there and was surprised that she was still alive or not in a coma and they rushed her to the ER and she, they got her, you know, back stabilized. And uh, again, just the medicine plus the surgery, it was on her brain. She was still very much suicidal. She's like, why am I here? I don't want to be here. A um, couple days after that, um, my, I'm, I was, uh, me and my dad, my aunt and uncle were, you know, trying to decide how we we're going to take care of my grandmother and, um, Next thing I know, everybody was gone. And I, it was just me and my grandma. And then a few days later, they all come back. I go home to get some sleep. And then, like, boom. Guns are drawn. They're ready to, like, they're at it with each other. People want to kill oh. this person and that person for some money or this. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, we were, we were literally just like Christmas was, you know, other than finding out about my grandmother before Christmas, Christmas was good. And now everybody is at odds with each other and, and I'm having to play peacemaker. Oh, no. Um, and, and it, meanwhile, I'm grieving cause I'm, I'm anticipating the loss of my grandmother and it's, it's very hard. Um, uh, and so I, I'm there and I'm there with grandma. My dad flees, um, is on the run, um, deemed armed and dangerous. My grand, my aunt and uncle go back to Alabama where they're, where they're living and I'm just there. And so it's like day after day, groundhog day is kind of how I, how I describe it of, you know, one, making sure grandma is not still suicidal. Uh, and then 
trying to feed her because she's diabetic and she needs to keep her sugar at a certain level. We can't just eat cookies all day long, grandma. Just like back and forth, giving her her shots, um, making sure that all the other medicine is, is, you know, being administered and everything else. And it was exhausting. And, and so, um, eventually, you know, tried to garner some support from my grandfather who, um, they had been together most of my life, but then ended up separating, uh, toward, uh, I don't know, sometime in my adult, uh, adulthood. And, but I called him over and he loves her and she loves him. Like they, they love each other. Um, so he comes and helps. And that was helpful, uh, until I had a, I had a trip planned to go to Hawaii for my birthday, um, which was in the spring of 2019, went to Hawaii, came back and my grandmother, um, hates me. Like, just despises me. And I'm like confused at why. Turns out, you know, um, it, she had been fed that I had been stealing from her and taking advantage of her in her state. And it was just, everything was misconstrued and spun in a way to benefit other people, uh, because of money basically. And I, you know, that was heartbreaking for me because I heard my grandma mother say things to me that she had never in a million years would have said to me in a clear mind, but the but tumors were pressing on her and everything else. And so I lost my grandmother earlier than when she passed, honestly. Um, and because of, you know, the people who were involved in spreading those lies, uh, they were good as dead to me because my grandmother was the most loving and nurturing person that I've ever had in my life. And I felt cheated by those last couple months that I didn't get to spend with her. And, and part one of those people was my dad, you know, person who, again, I, I said, we became best friends, loved him to death, still love him. Uh, but it was just, it was one of those things that's like, I can, I, I don't know if I can forgive you for this. Like, this is, this is too painful. Um, I ultimately did. I think that was a part of my healing journey is to get to a place to realize that he was triggered and he was hurt and he was grieving in those moments. Um, and I, I do forgive him for that, um, but still not to a point where I would allow him back into my life. Um, I think there, there's there's one pain of pushing away and, and setting a boundary. Uh, there's another pain of having you in my life and seeing what, what that's going to cause. And so um, I chose the former. And so shortly after that, my mom, who I had had a very rocky relationship with basically since my my late teenage years on um she responded in a way that was very hurtful and harmful um and i had to set a boundary with her it's just like this is this is very unhealthy our relationship and how um it's being um just brought like basically so my grandmother passed away i really wanted some nurturing. I want, I needed some nurturing. And so I went back to my mom after like, we really hadn't talked for a while. Um, and just wanted to be hugged and loved and all of that. We had like lunch on her birthday and it was fantastic. And then, um, after my grandmother passed, she just like, I don't know, like, like started to, um, react in a way that was not loving. And, to the point where, you know, saying just really hurtful things like my life would have been better had I aborted you, like you were the problem. And I felt that all my life, like that was a part of my, a deep part of my sense of self and the inner critic that plays in the back of my head that makes me feel guilty for doing good things or being exposed to good things because I am the issue in other people's lives. Um, that just kept coming up. And so I was just like, you know, I love you absolutely love you but i'm i'm at a point in my life where i need to work on myself because i am down i am so depressed i'm so just hurt um and i'm gonna be doing that i'm gonna be getting my my work and i hope that you do too and i just left it at that and i said i love you and so that's been uh almost five years wait is it five yeah four years it's been over a little bit over four years and um so yeah, that that's three people of, of the four that really raised me. And then um, January, January 9th of 2020, right before COVID hit, my grandfather of the the, you know, one that one that loved my grandmother, he he passed away. And it was just like, okay. I felt like 
starting at like this like blank slate of like, okay, I got to find who loves me. And um, I have, I have my wife, I have friends and support. I have a lot of people who love me, but that like, it was just a really weird moment for me to have lost all of them. And um, yeah, so that, you know, and I, I felt, you know, kind of like with football, like there's, there's an active choice of saying, I'm not going to do this, but it still causes hurt. Um, but then with boundaries and estrangement, sometimes that is the same way. Like you make this active choice to protect yourself. Again, like I said, there's two pains. You you choose the one that is going to be least harmful, but it still leaves grief. There's still loss there. And um, sometimes it's unavoidable, but um, you learn to grow around that as opposed to, you know, just allowing it to continuously harm you. Yeah. Well, doing that is an incredibly mature thing to do. Um, and you look like a very young person. So I'm going to guess you were even younger there, uh, younger then, obviously. Um, but that self-preservation and and keeping hold of your, your needs ab above someone else's who's toxic or whatever it might be. Um, I can relate to that a bit. I had a very um, um, abusive mother. And when I became an adult, had to just cut that and just say, you know what, I, I don't, I don't need this in my life. And it was, and I grieved it as well, because I, I never had that, that nurturing relationship with a mother that I, I envy my friends that have. Um, and I've done a lot in my, as my, as my own, as a mother myself, to make sure that my kids have that for me. So, you know, you learn from that, but still it is a, is a grieving process. I mean, it, it's, it's definitely is. I mean, you grieve the relationship you didn't have, um, or that you won't have, or whatever it might be when that happens. And, and that's, that's sad. So you eventually went on to write a book. So tell us a little bit about this book and, you know, why you wrote it and what it's about and who is, who is it aimed at? Yeah. So the book kind of stem started at the uh, January 1st, 2019 moment. Uh, that's when I started writing. I was looking for ways to cope that were healthy that, um, cause everything that I had done pre pre previously wasn't working. I was a, I think my defense mechanism a lot was to just work, 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 grind, put my head down, get a lot done. And I just couldn't, I couldn't move. And so, but I could write. And so I, I wrote and I talked about what was going on in, in that time. And I'm sure like even just recapping those three moments of grief, like there's much more detail in that last one, just because it was so fresh. It was so on my mind. And so I just started writing a lot of different things about that moment. Um, and then once I got to all those people passing, I, well, no, prior to that, I, I had a, um, prior to my grandfather passing, I had things like severe anxiety that kept me up for almost a month, I think like 27 days of like no sleep and I, and all these other triggers. And I, I had this anxiety attack and was crying and blabbering and just like incoherent. And I finally got sleep that night, but I remember being having this out of body experience in that moment and saying, how in the world did you end up here? And that's the question that I sought to answer in the book. And it stemmed from unresolved trauma for my entire life. And I, again, had pushed all of that down and instead of dealing with it, I, I worked, I achieved, I, you know, I, I did a lot of things, but I never addressed my trauma. And so the journey of writing the book and even since that moment was, was to heal myself and to figure out how to prevent this for someone else, if, if possible. And that's what the book is. It's, it's my story. It's my life. It talks about, so the, 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 the title is perseverance through severe dysfunction ptsd is the that acronym um breaking the curse of intergenerational trauma as a black man in america and you know i i talk about the things that led to uh my ptsd or my complex trauma and um then the the good the bad the ugly of it all but then like hey i got to this point very low point and i need to find some way out of it and these are healthy things that I decided to do or healthy things that just like happened in my life that um, have really started this, this shift in how I show up every day. And I continued talking about that after the book, but like it was just the earliest moment of like, I finally went up 
and got counseling and it was grief counseling. And I, and I think, you know, being in a state, you know, mental health is stigmatized uh, on a global scale, but especially in the black community, especially for a black man. And, and so to be, to, when grandma passes, I feel like that's kind of a universal time where people are like, I'm sad. My grandma passed like, and people understand that. So there's less stigma there. So I felt comfortable going in for grief counseling, but little did I know grief counseling would then lead to, you know, this deep trauma counseling, then this group counseling around trauma and all this other stuff that was like, I've needed this my entire life. And it was just, it was just a catalyst. It was a catalyst for so much good, but um, perseverance through severe dysfunction, again, talks through my journey, but then and and to at, answer that question of how the how in the world did I end up here looks at you know bigger issues because my mom wasn't the only teen parent you know at the time in fact in 1990 the year I was you know in my mom's belly uh, it was the highest teen pregnancy rate in the entire country ever still to this day and uh, my dad was the only person who went to prison and you know all these different things that happened to my life there was a bigger story being told behind that and so I connect my personal story with that bigger story um, so that people don't feel as alone and right. people understand that um, you know you're going through something and nobody's story is exactly like yours but there is somebody that uh, can potentially relate because um, I think we heal in community and if yeah. you can find a community of folks who have have something that you can, you know, talk about, relate to, uh, it just helps you a little bit more. And then on the other side, it's, it's people who don't know what trauma is because they've never experienced it in their life. Um, how they would define it. I think everyone has experienced some form of trauma, but, um, and, and give them a window into a world that they may know nothing about and how that affects people. And you may see a person and, and they could, you know, cognitively be very bright and do all the things right. But then underneath there's this like impulsivity that keeps them in trouble or there's something that's just, is all, and it may be related to trauma. And I know, you know, under like people, especially interpersonal relationships for me are very difficult because of my trauma. Um, and so while I can show up, you know, this way, nine times out of 10, there might be that one time that is triggered. I've been triggered or you've triggered me or somebody has, and you, you're not going to understand it. But maybe if you read this, maybe you will. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah. You're, you're, that, that whole process of this is so common for people who've undergone something like that, where it's just, you know, understanding it as part of the problem or you know, part mm -hmm. of the solution, I should say. Um, so now I, you know, you're starting up your own podcast or start up your own podcast. So tell us what that's all about. What, what's the name of it and, and what, what, what is it you're doing? Yeah. So it is called vulnerability muscle and it's all about embracing vulnerability um, and looking at vulnerability as a strength and not a weakness. Um, I think for too long and, and too often we look at vulnerability and, and, emotions as something that makes us lesser than or weaker but it is literally the fab that the the thing that makes us human and um to get people's stories out there um who probably don't necessarily have a platform to tell their stories so that again going back to community like somebody's going to be able to relate somehow some way to what you've gone through and be able to heal from that. And so I think the more we tell stories, the more we are able to heal, but also able to connect, um, build, build, you know, we can reconcile with someone that we have nothing in common with or know nothing about if we know a little bit of their stories and we can empathize with it. And so it's, it's all about telling stories so that we can build connection and start to heal. Yeah. I think a lot of us feel like, you know, we're the only ones who are living this, this reality, whatever it might be. Um, and even, I mean, you and I are very different. Uh, we're, you're the same age as my oldest son. So it's like, you know, we, we're different generation and so on. And yet a lot of your story resonates with me and my own story. So it's like, you know, to not, I wouldn't know that unless I heard your story that we have that mm -hmm. common quality, right? Whereas mm -hmm. you know, to be able to hear those stories and have people say, oh, wow, that that's something that I've experienced too. And, and, and I'm very different or whatever, but I still experienced that thing or I still had that same mm -hmm. reaction. Um, or whatever it is to whatever they've gone through. So I think that that part of the community part of it to sort of cross those those diversity things, especially to say, you know what, we're not really all that different when it comes down to that level of, you know, 
how we deal with with trauma and tragedy and so on because it's a very human thing and we're all humans, yes so, yeah so um if someone were listening to us today that you know is kind of resonating with some of your story i mean what would you uh, what would your advice be? I mean, you mentioned some of the things that, that really helped you, but um, overall, if you had a young person that was, you know, kind of coming out of the same kind of childhood and, and having some of the same issues, you know, what would you, what would you say to them? I would say, um, try to find someone safe to speak to, whether it be a professional or not, but someone safe to speak to about the things that you have shame around. And shame is the one of the hardest things to open up about, to talk about, but you have insecurities and they're wrapped up in the shame that is wrapped that it that stems from this trauma. Um, but the moment you're able to lower that shame level on yourself, then the love of yourself rises and the vulnerability starts to rise. And then it's like this compounding effect of where, you know, you're less shameful, more, more vulnerable, less shameful, more loving, less shameful, more loving. And then I feel that's where you start to heal. And I don't, I, I would never recommend somebody be vulnerable with people that are unpredictable or who they don't trust or don't feel safe with. So it definitely requires being around someone, having at least one person in your life. Um, and if you don't have anybody, you know, that you, that, uh, around your circle, uh, find a professional who is literally trained and, and going to be that person for you without the fear of them telling someone else or your story getting out there is literally meant to help you. So I, I would say find a, a safe person, find safe people and and surround yourself with them. Yeah. That's a, that's a common thing that people tell me on this podcast, by the way, is find that safe person. And that, that safe person may not be a family member or even mm. like, it might be, so, you know, no. a professional it might be someone that you work with that you didn't even realize that that person was mm -hmm. safely share with. So um, important to look for that actually, especially before you need it would be my, my thought on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, anything <laughs> else you'd like to share before we end today? Um, I guess my social media handles are Reggie D Ford on uh, Instagram, Twitter, or X, Instagram, X, Facebook, Reggie D Ford. <laughs> and then uh, my website is Reggie D Ford.com. Uh, I, I do speaking at, at schools. I do speaking engagements for, uh, different organizations, different companies um, around vulnerability, authenticity, the effects of trauma, uh, how to show up and build connection, how to how to have a, a, a safe place where people feel like they belong. And so uh, if any of that sounds interesting, definitely yeah. hit me up. Awesome. And we're going to put links to all that when we air your episodes, so people can just do the one click thing and get right to those things without having to remember and write it down and, and search for you. So Reggie, yeah. thank you so much for your time today. It has been so interesting to chat with you and to hear your story. And I'm I'm actually really excited about the work you do. Thank you, Christine. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Good Grief. To hear more about my personal story, please pick up a copy of my book, The Day I Became the Spider Killer, a memoir of trauma, tragedy, and survival, available in paperback, Kindle, and Audible via Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other online book retailers.